Hi and welcome to my OCR A level biology revision with me Christine. So in this lesson I'm going to look at DNA replication. So it's important to note that before you do this please do check out my nucleotide structure video because it's important that you understand how DNA molecule is actually made and what it's made up of so you can understand how DNA replication actually works. So we know that we've got a double helix of DNA and we know that our nitrogenous bases are held together with hydrogen bonds. So the first enzyme we need to discuss is helicase. So helicase is the enzyme that is needed to unzip the DNA molecule. And what that means is it's going to break the hydrogen bonds between those complementary base pairs. Now remember, adenine and thymine always pair together and cytosine and guanine always pair together because they form hydrogen bonds because of this complementary base pairing. So what we want to do is we want to separate those two strands so that we can use them as template strands for building our new strand. So what we now know is that by using the helicase we unzip, we break those hydrogen bonds. So now we have one template strand and we then have free nucleotides and what will happen is those free nucleotides will actually come along and form hydrogen bonds with those exposed complementary base pairs. Now remember because we've separated the DNA strand which is made up of two anti-parallel strands, this is happening on both strands. These complementary base pairs are happening to each of the template strands. Our guanine and cytosine are forming three hydrogen bonds and our adenine and thymine are forming two hydrogen bonds. So once the complementary base pairs have aligned, what then needs to happen is our DNA polymerase will form phosphodiester bonds between the adjacent nucleotides and that's what forms your sugar phosphate backbone. Now the DNA polymerase can only build in a 5 to 3 direction and that's important for us to understand that what we're talking about here is that the DNA polymerase can only add at the 3 carbon end and the reason it can only add at the 3 carbon end is because what it is doing is it's creating a phosphodiester bond between the hydroxyl group at carbon 3 and the phosphate. So what that means is that free hydroxyl group at carbon 3 allows for the new nucleotide to be built, to make it into a polymer, hence why its name is DNA polymerase. So we understand that our DNA polymerase can only build in a 5 to 3 direction. Well, because our DNA strands are anti-parallel, that therefore means that the DNA polymerase will actually move in opposite directions. Well, you can quite clearly see that my DNA polymerase has come to the end of a strand here. Well, what that then means is that that will release and it will then have to bind again to the template strand a bit further back and work its way down. That therefore means that we have what's known as a leading strand which is continually being built and we have what's known as a lagging strand and that lagging strand because the DNA polymerase can only build in a 5 to 3 direction and it has to be released and moved backwards leaves us with these fragments, these Okazaki fragments. So the third enzyme we need to know is the final one which is going to actually form a phosphodiester bond between the Okazaki fragments on that lagging strand. So our Okazaki fragments will only be on our lagging strand and this ligase is the enzyme that's going to join those two together by finalizing those phosphodiester bonds. So that is important if we want to use that in any form later on when you look at module six and you do biotechnology. So if we look at it in a, a big diagram, then what we have is the helicase is constantly working its way up, unwinding and then unzipping the hydrogen bonds, therefore exposing the template strands the DNA polymerase is building in a 5 to 3 direction and it is building those phosphodiester bonds. 
the free nucleotides are going to complementary base pair. So they're going to come together with their complementary base pairing. And then the ligase is going to join those fragments together. So how do we know then that it's called semi-conservative replication? So we have our original strand, which acts as the template. We have hydrogen bonds that are being broken. We have complementary base pairing, which is happening with our new free nucleotides. And what we end up with is one old strand and one new strand. Now you can quite clearly see, I've color coordinated my strand so that we can tell the difference between the original strand and the new strand. Well, this comes down to the work done by Messerson and Stahl, where they grew E. coli bacteria in a growth medium that contained only a heavy isotope. So therefore, the nitrogenous bases contained nitrogen, which was the isotope of N15. So once they'd grown the E. coli bacteria in this growth medium, they then transferred that bacteria to a growth medium that had only a light isotope, so N14. They allowed the bacteria to undergo cell division. And then what they did is they observed it after they had centrifuged to see what had happened to the DNA at different generations. So when we start with our original heavy isotope, what we know is that the DNA strands contain the heavy isotope of N15. So our generation zero is built with the original strand, which is N15, N15. Then we take that generation zero and we now grow it in a medium which only allows the light N14 isotope. What then happens is the hydrogen bonds are broken between the two strands. The free nucleotides now only have the light isotope and therefore what we end up with is our new strand being built with N14 and our original strand having N15. So what we see is after one generation, the DNA is actually comprised of N14 and N15. So if we centrifuge that, what we end up with is 100% of the band will be shown as lighter than the original generation zero, which was N15, N15. And if we continue to go through doing this with each generation, what then happens is because our generation one is now going to have the hydrogen bonds broken between the two strands, that means that we've now got an original strand which is N15 and an original strand which is N14 for each of these DNA molecules. That therefore results in now, because the new strand can only ever be built with N14, as having 50% which is N15, N14, and 50% which is now N14, N14. And what we do is with each generation, we keep doing that. And what you can see is the concentration, which is N15, N14, gets less and less and less. Because remember, we only started out with two strands, which were N15. So as we continue on, we start to see that that will get less and less and less because every time it takes the original from the generation before, it breaks that apart and that acts as a template. And then the new strand gets built from those free nucleotides, which are only made up of that light isotope. So random spontaneous mutations, these unpredictable changes in the sequence of DNA can occur during DNA replication. This is where errors have occurred through that complementary base pairing it should line up adenine and thymine, cytosine and guanine, but sometimes errors occur. And if those errors do occur, they are random, they are spontaneous, and they will then be potentially passed on through the to the next generation through that process of cell division. Well, that links to your cell division topic and looking at your checkpoints, which try to ensure that any of these errors that have occurred 
are corrected before the cell goes through the division process. However, that doesn't necessarily happen. So it's important that we note that they are random and they are spontaneous and they can be passed on. And you'll learn more about that when you look at module six and mutations. So I hope you've liked this video and if you have, then do please click on the like button and subscribe to my channel. Also, if you haven't already, please check out my revision platform, www.aiqchat.com to help with your revision.